The article I chose to talk about is by Guru Nasipalu and is entitled Architectural Dialogues Across the Eastern Mediterranean, Monumental Domed Sanctuary Sanctuaries in the Ottoman Empire and Renaissance Italy. I was drawn to this article as, an, as I am personally fascinated with Middle Eastern architecture, specifically Ottoman design and architecture, from the 15th to 18th century Ottoman Imperial era. Really quickly, for those who don't know, the Ottoman Empire, from its insurgence in 1299 until its fall to the Young Turks in the aftermath of World War I in the early 20th century, was ruled by the Imperial Ottoman Sultans, who were all descendants of the Osmanlu family. <clears throat> in her article, Nasipalu specifically contrasts the resurgence of architecture in Italy, specifically Rome, under the rule of warrior Pope Julius II and onwards, with the resurgence of architecture across the Ottoman Empire, specifically in Constantinople, under Sultan Mehmed II, also known as Mehmed the Conqueror, and his predecessors. Nesipolu argues that the Ottoman world and the world of Renaissance Italy were in communication with each other not only about matters of politics and economics, but also design and art. Specifically, Nesipolu argues that the Ottoman desire to reforge the former capital of the Eastern Roman Empire is marred with parallels and overlap with the Italian papal desire to rebuild the capital of the Western Roman Empire. Starting in the 1450s, the Islamic world was in a period of upheaval. The Umayyad Caliphate that had spanned from Spain to Persia had fallen a century before, and the empire had since been divided into fracturing, warring houses. In 1455, the Ottoman sultans declared themselves absolute rulers of the former Islamic world and captured Byzantine Constantinople the same year. In 1492, the Catholic kings of the Habsburg House from Northern Europe pushed the last of the Nasrids out of Spain, ending centuries of Islamic dominance over the Iberian Peninsula, and in 1517, the Ottomans further solidified their empire by defeating the Mamelukes and seizing their territories of the Levant and Egypt. While Charles V, the then Holy Roman Empire, worked to consolidate the Habsburg hold on Europe, Sultan Mehmed II monopolized power at home. Europe took a breath, and there was a cautious period of no war. The Mediterranean worlds focused on rebuilding their empires. Nesipalu argues that this crucial period of rebuilding of those empires simultaneously were more interconnected and interdisciplinary than people think. She argues that the Ottoman and Italian Renaissance designers and architects equally sought to rebuild empires in the fashion of Roman antiquity. Granted, the product of both of these worlds' efforts to that effect were quite different, but they were rooted in the same desire, to look to the Romans, as both worlds were the heart of the old Western and the old Eastern Roman empires. Nesipalu's primary evidence for a demonstrated working relationship between the Eastern and Western empires at a state and artisan level is mainly based on invitations from the sultans to Italian artists as well as a wealth of communication between the two worlds. Additionally, Nesipalu also points to the countless similarities in the way Renaissance Italians and the Renaissance Ottomans designed their buildings and cities. Her first example of this is the fascination in Renaissance Italy and the Ottoman Empire with the dome. Although they are visually expressed differently in both regions, the clear concept of either a centrally or longitudinally planned dome structure is consistent throughout. Additionally, there is precedent for both of these Nesipalu Nesipalu points out, throughout Italy and Byzantium in the form of buildings like the Pantheon in Rome and the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. Obviously, these were both constructions of Western and Eastern Roman antiquity, pointing to the underlying conceptual similarities between the two regions' architectural resurgences. Following periods of conquest and consolidation under Mehmed II, the man at the heart of the the man was at the heart of the Ottoman desire to rebuild a new Eastern Roman Empire, and a new Jerusalem. While in Europe, the Habsburgs believed, them, believed themselves to be the Holy, Roman, the Holy Roman Emperors of the West, the Sultans believed themselves to be the heirs apparent to the Roman Empire in the East. However, in practicality, the Sultan simply espoused big goals and ideas of restoring Byzantium to its former glory. The man behind the, execu the execution of his plans was his chief architect, Sinan. Sinan's first mark on Byzantium was a renovation and restoration of the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. 
in the same way that St. Peter's in Rome would become the pinnacle of architectural precedent in the West for decades to come, the Hagia Sophia would serve as the same purpose in the East. Sinan's second project in Constantinople was a mosque complex directly adjacent to the Hagia Sophia, where he experimented with centrally planned courtyard spaces with slender, graceful columns. This marked a shift away from previous Islamic precedent, where mosques typically had short, stocky columns that would support a dome, and Sinan moved towards a more Italianate style of many slender columns holding up the dome. It's hypothesized by Nessie Paulu that this shift was the result of Sinan's reading of the works of Vitruvius and Alberti, who reaffirmed a similar position to Sinan's. Sinan's new mosque had other big conceptual similarities to new designs in the West. It was the core evolution of precedent. In Vasari's writings, looking back at Bermonti's work, Nessie Paulu points out, Vasari notes that Bermonti, too, was obsessed with the correction and the updating of precedent in the West. Mehmed and Sinan's interest in the workings of the Italian Renaissance is also apparent in their multiple unsuccessful attempts to invite the Bolognese architect Fiorvante in the 1470s to come to Constantinople. The string of subsequent in invitations, Nessie Paulu points out, brought copious amounts of more minor craftsmen from Florence and Rome to Constantinople up until Mehmed's death in 1481. Yet the desire to forge a new capital for the Ottoman Empire, steeped in antiquity, was even more alive in Mehmed's son, Bayezid II, who continued to use Sinan as his, as his chief architect when he ruled as Ottoman Sultan. The, Bayezid and Sinan unsuccessfully invited Michelangelo to come to Constantinople on multiple occasions. Meanwhile, in the West, warrior Pope Julius II was beginning construction of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Donato Bramante's design, although never realized, is uncannily visually similar to the, and didactically to the designs of the three Ottoman imperial mosques to date. The Hagia Sophia, the Mosque of Mehmed II, and then the recently finished Mosque of Bayezid II under Sinan. This is Nessie Paulu's main evidence to support communication with Bramante and other Italian Renaissance architecture of the time with the East in a far greater capacity than ever before thought. She cites drawings by Giulio and Francesco da Sandalo, as well as a foundation medallion that was produced to mark the resumption of construction to St. Peter's. In the drawings and the foundation medallion, the image is clear. Bramante's design included a central dome with similar supporting domes flanked by two towers. In the east, these were the minarets of the Hagia Sophia, and in the west, they were the bell towers of St. Peter's. Nessie Paulu argues that Bramante and Pope Julius' decision to include Eastern and Western architectural elements was a gesture of Western papal supremacy over the East. Additionally, Nesipalu notes, there was a Western architectural precedent in the Hagia Sophia. The Hagia Sophia was originally formed, was originally a church founded by the Christian Emperor Constantine following the fall of the Western Roman Empire and him moving the capital to Byzantium. The Hagia Sophia was further renovated by one of Constantine's successors, Emperor Justinian, and dubbed the New Temple of Jerusalem, in reference to shifting the heart of Christianity away from the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and folding it into the Eastern Roman ilk. This is even more important since Pope Julius II was calling for a new crusade to liberate not only Jerusalem, but also Constantinople, and had grand plans to celebrate Mass in Constantinople as soon as it fell. Although his attempts to instigate a new crusade failed, Julius grew even more attached to the idea that St. Peter should be the ultimate architectural expression of Christian faith in the world. Nessie Paulo postulates that Michelangelo, upon assuming control of the project of St. Peter's, studied the Hagia Sophia intensely as he formulated his new designs. Nessie Paulo argues specifically that Michelangelo's infamous dome was actually the result of a conceptual and technical study of domes being built in the Ottoman Empire at the time something Nessu Paulu argues Michelangelo would have had access to, not directly from going there, but through the craftsmen that had returned to Italy after being invited by Mehmed, as well as Michelangelo's numerous merchant contacts. Nessie Paulu argues that this is also plausible, given Michelangelo's revised models for the dome following flaws in the earlier versions bore a striking similarity to Ottoman domes in the east rather than anything that had been or was being built in the west. The Hagia Sophia continued to be a core precedent for Italian designers in the coming centuries, Nessie Paolo notes, as one of Borromini's key precedents for St. Ivo alla Sapienza was the Hagia Sophia, 
However, it should be noted, and Nessie Paulu points out, that Western artists and designers didn't treat their Eastern counterparts as equals. The common argument in the West was that everything the, Ottoman did, the Ottomans did in their new buildings was that it was simply copies of the Hagia Sophia, which was constructed by the Romans. Nevertheless, it was also clear that they borrowed from the Ottomans just as much as the Ottomans borrowed from the Italians. Nesipalu furthers the idea of cooperation and cross-study between the East and the West by postulating that during the mid-Quattrocento, the three most prominent architects in the world were Michelangelo, Andrea Palladio, and Sinan. Nesipalu even cites examples of architectural drawings of Ottoman buildings by Sinan being translated into other European languages and circulated all throughout the Habsburg Empire. Additionally, Nessipalu points out that there is significant overlap between some of Palladio's closest patrons and patrons of Sinan and of the Imperial Ottoman court. Nessipalu points to a more overlap in Palladio and Sinan's outlook on design, mainly a drive for formal geometric clarity as well as having buildings that had simple white interiors filled with copious amounts of natural light. This is a marked departure in the East from the gilded churches of Byzantine antiquity and the darkened mosques. However, as Sinan continued to evolve and codify his work, as well as the work of other Ottoman architects in the East, Nesipalu claims he, the, the Ottoman Empire became more and more disinterested and receptive to the work of the West. Nesipalu concludes saying that it's important to think about the past in a realistic context, especially when thinking about divides between Eastern and Western designs and interactions that previously have been thought of as singular things and not things that could have had overlap. Personally, I really enjoyed the article and found it to be very compelling from an argumentative point of view, but also I really liked the well-cited evidence that Nesipalu presented, something that I have been deeply conscious of during my time as an architect and, an archi and, and as a student of architectural history is thinking about history and context in precedent from multiple lenses, from Eastern and Western angles and kind of angles of different cultures. And it, I think it was very clear that, you know, thinking about Eastern and Western Renaissance at the same time is a relatively new thing, and I think Nessie Paulo, it, it would appear, would be one of the first articles to try and set up those comparisons and think about it in a truly cross-disciplinary and kind of cross-regional manner, and I think I really, really appreciated that, and I think that, you know, that, that speaks volumes to the fact that there are lots of elements of architectural history that need to be re-examined under multiple cultural lenses, especially you know, moving away from this very um, Western Eurocentric approach to thinking about history in general, but also specifically architectural history um, as well.